Following the surrender of German forces in 1945, Allied soldiers uncovered the horrific reality of Nazi death camps such as Auschwitz, Dachau and Belsen. At least 11 million people, including Jews, Slavs, disabled people and homosexuals, had been murdered as a result of Nazi genocidal policy. That policy was directly inspired by the pseudoscience of eugenics, the idea that it's possible and desirable to improve the genetic quality of a human population. And while the Allies naturally abhorred the detestable crimes of the Nazis and punished the wrongdoers after the war. The uncomfortable truth is that Britain and America were the original breeding grounds for those same eugenic ideas. Modern eugenics had its origin in the 19th century with British scientist Francis Galton. A polymath who made important contributions to many fields, Galton was hugely influenced by his cousin Charles Darwin's Origin of Species. In his first chapter, titled Variation Under Domestication, Darwin explains how different breeds within a species are often produced from a common ancestor by a process of selective breeding. Galton was the first person to apply Darwin's ideas to humans. Convinced that traits like intelligence and ability were entirely determined by genetics, he asked whether it would be possible to give the more suitable races of blood a better chance of prevailing over the less suitable than they otherwise would have had. In 1883, Galton gave his new idea a name, eugenics, which he defined as the science of improving stock. By the turn of the 20th century, Britain's ruling establishment was looking for ways to make Britain a stronger, healthier and more productive nation. Galton's ideas began to attract interest. Eugenics was seen as a panacea. If the population was simply made better, then so many problems would be solved, from crime to poverty to mental illness. The liberal reformer William Beveridge, architect of the welfare state, and the economist John Maynard Keynes, a key thinker in 20th century liberal economics, were both prominent supporters. Even British liberals and progressives became enthusiastic about policies such as forced sterilization, which, if enacted, they believed could eradicate negative traits from the population. These negative traits range from specific mental disabilities to more abstract characteristics such as laziness or criminality, which many at the time believed were inherited. The Eugenics Education Society was founded in 1907. It argued, among other things, that poverty was rooted in the genetic deficiency of the working classes and that the feeble-minded should be prevented from having children. Thirty years before he led Britain to victory against Nazi Germany, Winston Churchill was honorary vice president of the Eugenics Education Society. In 1910, Churchill warned Prime Minister Herbert Henry Asquith about the very terrible danger to the race posed by the multiplication of the unfit. And as Home Secretary, Churchill went on to propose a series of eugenic policies, including forced sterilization and the prevention of marriage between those judged mentally unfit. He also planned labor colonies where the criminally feeble-minded could be detained. Long before anyone knew Hitler's name, Churchill was using the sort of language that would later be used by the Nazis to describe those who failed to live up to the standards of the master race. Around the same time, eugenics took root in the United States. In 1906, the inventor of cornflakes, J.H. Kellogg, founded the Race Betterment Foundation in Michigan. In 1911, the eugenicist Charles Davenport founded the Eugenics Record Office in New York. Kellogg and Davenport believed that eugenic policies could alleviate the economic burden caused by certain undesirable members of society, especially the disabled and the mentally ill. They enjoyed the financial backing of huge corporate foundations, including the Carnegie Institute and the Rockefeller Foundation. They held conferences, printed adverts for eugenic marriages, and published their research in journals and newspapers. The campaigns worked. In 1907, the state of Indiana passed the first compulsory sterilization law in the world. By 1924, 15 different states had passed similar legislation. These laws were passed in the hope that those deemed unfit to reproduce and the mentally ill wouldn't be able to pass on their inferior genes to the next generation. And these were popular policies. A 1937 Fortune magazine poll found that two-thirds of Americans supported eugenic sterilization of mental defectives and 63% supported sterilization of criminals. Between 1907 and 1963, over 65,000 people were sterilized against their will. Relative to the American population, a disproportionate number of those targeted were Black, Hispanic and Native 
Native American women. This demonstrates just how quickly the idea of eradicating negative traits was unmasked as a racist agenda. Eugenics led American policymakers to act even more atrocious than forced sterilization. A 1911 Carnegie report explored 18 different potential methods for removing defective genetic attributes and proposed euthanasia at number eight. One influential American textbook, Applied Eugenics by Paul Popno of the American Eugenics Society, argued that the first method which presents itself to cleanse the gene pool is execution. Its value in keeping up the standard of the race should not be underestimated. These ideas were actually put into practice in some states. One mental institution in Lincoln, Illinois, fed its patients milk that had been infected with tuberculosis in order that the genetically weak among them would be killed off. For eugenicists across the globe, the United States was the shining example of what eugenics could achieve. In Mein Kampf, published in 1925, Hitler lavished praise on American eugenicists. He claimed that he had studied with great interest the laws of several American states concerning prevention of reproduction by people whose progeny would be of no value or be injurious to the racial stock. Hitler and Churchill agreed America was doing a great job of eradicating the unfit through eugenic legislation. One American eugenicist Hitler particularly admired was the lawyer Madison Grant. In 1916, Grant published The Passing of the Great Race, in which he lamented the pollution of the Nordic race by other inferior races. Grant was less coy than earlier eugenicists about the racist basis of his thinking. To him, the solution was clear. The American population needed to be purified through immigration restriction, selective breeding, and sterilization. He argued that a rigid system of selection through the elimination of those who were weak or unfit would solve the whole question in 100 years, as well as enable us to get rid of the undesirables who crowd our jails, hospitals, and insane asylums. The Passing of the Great Race was the first non-German book to be reprinted by the Nazis when they took power. Hitler himself wrote to Grant saying, the book is my Bible. Hitler also deeply admired Henry Ford. As well as his motor company, Ford owned a newspaper called the Dearborn Independent, which from 1920 onwards regularly published articles on the so-called Jewish question. The articles employed all the classic anti-Semitic conspiratorial tropes that Jews secretly ran the world, controlled the media, and started wars for their own profit. These articles proved highly popular among the American public and were published in a book as the International Jew. This book went on to become a huge influence on many leaders of the Nazi party. Balder von Schirach, head of the Hitler Youth, said, The decisive anti-Semitic book I was reading and the book that influenced my comrades was that book by Henry Ford, The International Jew. I read it and became anti-Semitic. Hitler had a large portrait of Ford in his office, and in 1938, Ford was awarded the Grand Cross of the German Eagle, the highest medal Nazi Germany could bestow on a foreigner. He had, after all, helped to inspire the Nazi project. While eugenics may have been mainstream in Britain and America, there were those who saw it for what it was, a pseudoscience driven more by racism than by academic research. The anthropologist Franz Boas took aim at the eugenic idea that it's our genetic makeup that determines who we become. Instead, Boas argued our social and cultural environments play a much more significant role in shaping our character and ability than anything in our DNA. Notable among the opponents of eugenics was the English author and philosopher G.K. Chesterton. In 1913, when the British Parliament was debating the Mental Deficiency Act, which led to the institutionalization of those deemed mentally deficient, Chesterton argued that the aim of such institutionalization was to prevent any person whom these propagandists do not happen to think intelligent from having any wife or children. He pointed out that anyone could be accused of mental deficiency, from tramps and laborers to eccentric rustics, concluding that is the situation and that is the point. We are already under the eugenist state and nothing remains to us but rebellion. This was Chesterton's battle cry to the people of Europe, long before the genocidal realities of eugenic thinking were brought to light. But his rallying cry was ignored. When Hitler became Chancellor of Germany in 1933, one of the earliest laws he passed was the Law for the Prevention of Hereditary Diseased Offspring, which enabled the compulsory sterilization of citizens with genetic disorders. This legislation was directly based on the model eugenical sterilization law devised by the American eugenicist Harry L. Laughlin. 
Germany was imitating the American states, which had already passed the same laws. Harry Laughlin was given an honorary degree by Heidelberg University for his work in the science of racial cleansing. And upon returning from Germany in 1934, one California eugenicist congratulated his colleagues with the words, You will be interested to know that your work has played a powerful part in shaping the opinions of the group of intellectuals who are behind Hitler in this epoch-making programme. Everywhere I sense that their opinions have been tremendously stimulated by American thought. Under the Nazi regime, over 400,000 people were sterilised against their will. Among them were the disabled, the blind, the deaf, those of mixed race, schizophrenics and even alcoholics. Two years after the Nazis began their sterilisation programme, they passed the infamous Nuremberg Laws in 1935, which forbade marriage between Germans and Jews and excluded Jews from Reich citizenship. These laws laid the legal groundwork for the persecution of Jews in Germany. They echoed American legislation, particularly the laws which banned marriage between white and black Americans, and the Jim Crow segregation laws, which institutionalised economic, social and educational disadvantages for African Americans. It wasn't a great leap from sterilisation to the next stage of Nazi racial policy, the involuntary euthanasia programme, Action T4, which began in 1939. As part of this programme, up to 300,000 disabled people were killed in psychiatric hospitals across Germany in the occupied territories. Patients were transferred from their hospitals to special treatment centres run by teams of SS men wearing white coats in order to give a sense of medical professionalism. They were then taken into shower blocks and gassed to death using bottled carbon monoxide. Their bodies were cremated en masse and false death certificates were written up and sent to relatives. This euthanasia model was then adapted and expanded as part of the final solution to the Jewish question. At the end of 1941, the first extermination camps were constructed in occupied territories. These were places designed specifically for the purpose of genocide. It's not difficult to see how the same eugenic ideology that brought about forced sterilisation led to segregation, forced euthanasia and eventually to the extermination camps of Nazi Germany. In reaching its fullest expression, the British-born eugenics movement that inspired the Holocaust was revealed for what it was, a genocidal project of racial cleansing. Support for eugenics decreased dramatically during the 1940s as news emerged of what was happening at Auschwitz and other extermination camps in the form of eyewitness reports from escaped prisoners and information leaked from the Nazi high command. What followed was a rewriting of history that erased the role played by the UK and the US in the development of eugenics. In the decades following World War II, many eugenic societies changed their names and former eugenicists entered other fields of scientific research. The history books used in schools never mentioned it, but eugenic policies continued to be carried out in the US. As recently as 2011, a report revealed that 148 female prisoners in two California state prisons were sterilised without adequate informed consent between 2006 and 2011. In the post-war years, Britain and America helped to prosecute Nazi leaders during the Nuremberg trials. But as the chief US prosecutor wrote to President Harry Truman, the Allies themselves have done or are doing some of the very things we are prosecuting the Germans for. As the old Native American proverb has it, those who tell the stories rule the world. British and American eugenics is a story that has been purposefully not told, perhaps because to admit our involvement is simply too painful. It's easier just to pretend it never happened. But the words never again will only ring true if we tell the story of our own past and acknowledge the role played by Britain and the US in the rise of the eugenics movement, a movement that was key to the development of Hitler's genocidal ideology.